Um, it was great. Okay. Um, so for purposes of time, I actually wrote this all out. I'm just going to read it so that I am on time instead of telling you all that I want to tell you about the desert. Um, but if you've been paying attention to national news recently, you've heard about contestation over the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is slated to travel more than 1,000 miles from North Dakota to Illinois, crossing through a stretch of the Missouri River near the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation in North Dakota. This event has recently highlighted how tribes and environmentalists have common ground, in this case, against the pipeline. While environmentalists oppose the fossil fuel friendly pipeline as a matter of principle, the pipeline poses a much larger danger to Standing Rock. It risks the tribe's water supply, and building the pipeline itself, the act of construction, risks turning over previously undocumented burial, human burials and also destroying sacred sites. This pipeline threatens the treaty and the human rights of Standing Rock and other Sioux tribes by threatening sacred sites and burial grounds, traditional lands and resources, including water, and their self-determination. The indigenous, cultural, and economic rights that are so important but so often neglected in human rights discourses. It also highlights the structural conditions that have enabled these human rights abuses, the material histories of colonization in the US that have enabled the pipeline. But the partnerships that are present in the Standing Rock protests today help to show a dramatic example of activist coalitions to support the treaty and the human rights of Native Americans alongside environmental protection. And that's what I want to focus on today. So although this is a particularly dramatic example, most indigenous rights and most environmental movements are actually conducted in the drudgery of everyday life very slowly. In my experience at the Native American Land Conservancy, which is an intertribal Kuia and Chemehuevi land trust in Southern California, since 2005, or since I've been working there since 2012, but most recently as a human rights fellow this summer, um, reflects how the slow pace, this, the slow pace change. Um, my dissertation research focuses on the everyday practices of land conservation, examining how to do land conservation today in a moment in which land conservation must change under demands to protect human histories, but also to compensate for the future risks under climate change. This broad statement animates my dissertation, but it also considers, just as the Dakota Access Pipeline protests have highlighted, the question of how to do work that's at the borders, at the boundaries of what human rights practice is. And so today, I want to look briefly at a case in which environmental value and cultural value are not only entangled, but inseparable in the case of a conservation project that I worked on this summer um, in an area known to locals as Coyote Hole near Joshua Tree, California. So what is a coyote hole? In a technical sense, it's a small catchment where water collects when it rains. Um, the water mixes with sand. And then, so if you dig down like a coyote, then you actually get down there where the water collects and you have access to this water. So it's a natural spring, it's a little catchment. Um, but for locals, this location, this is Coyote Hole, this is where the water collects here and back here. It's sort of hard to see. Um, but for locals, Coyote Hole, this place, actually recalls a hangout spot for high schoolers, a place where lots of people party. So it's littered. Um, there's a lot of trash. It's also a very good chuckwalla watching spot. And it's a place to view petroglyphs which are the, trace, the material traces that are etched into the stone's uh, patina to evidence Native American tribes and their presence there. Um, it's a parcel that the county flood district uh, has been in control of for a long time. It's a parcel where there was dynamiting on the wall, um, which you can see here how areas have been dynamited. Um, but it's also, it's a product of colonialism today. For environmentalists, they have a stake in protecting this area because it's, air, it's a spring area. It has a lot of natural diversity, which is shown by the ferns and mesquite, which you can sort of see some uh, cat claw acacia down there. Um, but for tribes, it's not only a place of cultural heritage, but it's a place that's important precisely because of the biological conservation value as seen by environmentalists. So Coyote Hole attracts culturally important animals who get a gulp of water from this natural spring. So the threat here, what's interesting about Coyote Hole is it's not the, you know, this large imposing doom of the pipeline. This Coyote Hole has been made through everyday practices for a long time, both of tribes historically, and then in more contemporary moments 
through the litter of high school th kids, through the graffiti of these high school kids. So one of the projects that I worked on this summer was actually cleaning up some of this graffiti, which you can sort of see here. Um, so a, I participated in a cleanup that was organized jointly by the Native American Land Conservancy and the Mojave Desert Land Trust, which was attempting to counteract some of these very long accumulated damages to Coyote Hole. It attempted to both reverse the processes of wastelanding that made Coyote Hole into an okay place to do graffiti, but it also um, worked to try and restore the importance of cultural rights through the educational programs that were going on alongside this cleanup project. So it's a slow process. It's riddled with challenges, including the fact that um, we had to answer questions about how to do culturally appropriate graffiti removal, and then also think about problems of access. We have to deal with the long histories of forced dispossession of natives from this area, as well as the intentional destruction of this region by dynamiting processes by the county, as well as unintentional pro or perhaps more malicious but less evident uh, practices which would be the local graffitiing. But it's the same kind of slow violence that would eventually be enacted by, for example, the Dakota Access Pipeline, through the slow leakages that come out the other end. So that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs>